Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the folks who have gathered here in person and welcome to those who are gathering online with us this morning. Just a couple notes about the service this morning. Uh, there should be a connection card, a bright yellow insert in your bulletin this morning. I uh, would love you to fill that out this morning, especially if there's any updated contact information or you'd like the church to have that, just so that we know that you're here this morning. And also on the screen is an online uh, connection card, and you can fill that out if you're watching from home as well. Uh, for prayer requests, uh, if you fill out that prayer section for those online, uh, we'll go ahead and include those prayer requests in the service this morning. For those here in person, uh, there was a prayer podium you passed on the way in. If you missed that on your way in and there's anything you'd like us to include in the prayers this morning, uh, please slip out during the opening hymn and jot that down there and we'll be sure to include that in the service this morning. Well, of course, today is a very special celebration, uh, the joy of having Pastor David Grainson with us for the trial sermon and for the congregational vote this morning. Our church council president, Lanny Lewis, said something very, very wise uh, this week when we were talking about today. Lanny said that with all of the stress all of the details, all of the commotion, and all the things that lead to this point, Lanny said, I think it's 
It's, it's letting us rob the joy of getting to this point. And I think that's very, very wise. It made me think of a woman, I think I mentioned her in a sermon, who completely forgot her son's wedding because she was so stressed about all the details. I visited her and she said, I, I was at the end of the service and I said, what happened? She just stressed out. So my suggestion this morning is as we uh, confess uh, and are reminded of God's forgiveness, just let all these details, let all the things that, that are bothering you in your life and to get to this point as a congregation, let them all go and just enjoy, enjoy the wonderful day that we have together, okay? So I'll ask you to stand as we continue with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we, we confess, confess that we are held captive by sin. In, in spite of our best efforts, efforts we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing together our opening hymn, Holy God, we praise your name.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. So good morning, my brothers and sisters. A special good morning to our young disciples who I would like to invite to come forward and join me up here. I'm just going to take a seat and you can join me right up here, wherever you feel comfortable. All right. So good morning. Oh, I'm over here. All right, I'm going to ask you guys a question. First, let me introduce myself. So my name is Pastor David, and I'm hoping to be the new pastor here at St. Michael. I met you guys yesterday, right? I met some of you yesterday, some not for the first time. So I want to talk to you about a couple of things. So the first thing I want to ask you is a question. So, and you don't have to know this answer yet because you guys are pretty young. Who thinks would they know what they want to be when they grow up? What would you like to be? A pastry chef. I have somebody who also wants to be a pastry chef. One of my guys wants to be a pastry chef. Very cool. Who else knows what they might want to be when they grow up? A farmer. A farmer. Awesome. You know, when I was little, I wanted to be... Or a milk truck driver. You could do... Maybe you could do both. Maybe you could have the dairy farm and drive the truck. That's very cool. What would you like to be? A mechanical engineer. Ooh, nice. How about you? A road paver and a milk truck driver. So you're going to pave the road and then drive the milk truck on it. Yes. With, with cows. With cows, too? Very cool. Somebody else had their hand up over here. Nobody? Anybody else who want to know what they might want to be? Okay, so you got plenty of time to figure that out. Oh, so, yes, what would you like to be? A dancer and an actor. Very cool. We'll keep our eye on you, right? We'll see you in Hollywood. Very cool. Very cool. So, again, you have plenty of time to figure this out, but it's sometimes we eventually we get a sense of what we want to do, right? And sometimes that stays the same, and sometimes that changes. But in the first reading today, there's this, this story about a guy named Jeremiah. And God says to him, Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. And he tells Jeremiah what he wants him to do with his life. And he tells him, everything you need, I'm going to give you. Now, God, we have a plan for our life and what we want to be, and we may end up a milk truck driver or a farmer or a pastry chef or whatever else, or an actor and a singer, a dancer. But God also has a mission for our life, just like he did for Jeremiah. And before we were born, God knew us. And God knew how special God made us, because each and every one of you are extraordinary. You're special. Because God has a plan just for you, and it's something that only you can do, no one else. And God has made that your special mission in the world. So even if you become a road paver, or a farmer, or a mechanical engineer, or an actor, or whatever you're going to be, God still has that special plan for you. And God's going to give you everything you need to make that plan come true. And no matter what anyone says, either now or at another time, you are special. And you are beautiful and you are extraordinary. Because God made you that way. And that can never be taken away. So I want to give you something today that's going to remind you that God made a special plan for you from before you were born. Made a special, let's call it like a special mark. Because God knows who you, he wants you to be. So here's what we're going to do. I have this little stamper, right? It's a little hand. So there's a story, a beautiful story, 
It's a Hebrew legend that before you were born, your souls were up in heaven, and you saw all of the beauty that was in heaven. You saw all the mysteries and the beauty and the wonder of God. But before you came down into this world, an angel came to you and did this. The angel put their finger over your lip and said, you can't tell the secrets of heaven. And that is why, if you look at your lip, you have a little mark right there. That's from the angel putting the angel's finger over your lip saying, you couldn't tell the secrets of heaven. So you have been touched by God from before you were born. So this little hand, I'm going to put this, if it's okay, on your hand. And I want you, when you look at it, give me the back of your hand if you want to. You don't have to. I want you, when you look at that today, to remember that God has marked you as special and important. It comes off with water, moms and dads. <laughs> and to remember that God has a very special plan for you in your life from before you were born. It's for you, and for you, and for you. No? Okay, all right. So again, when you look at this today, remember you are important and you are special that you have been touched by God from the first moment of your life to do something beautiful and extraordinary. Okay? All right. So let's say a quick little prayer before we head back. So let's pray. What do we do? We take a deep breath. We close our eyes and we pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift that you have given to us in our life. We thank you for the plan you have made for us. Help us always to focus on you, to know that we are important and sacred and beautiful in you and that can never be taken away. Loving God, we lift this prayer to you in Jesus' name, and we say it together, amen. All right, thank you, guys. first reading is from the first chapter of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I, informed you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I point you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove the mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for the prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. 
I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do also here in your hometown the things we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow of Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them, and went on his way. The gospel, the good news of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So before I begin the sermon today, I just want to say to all of you how amazingly blessed I consider myself on this day. There have been so many days and weeks that I have anticipated this and, and watched from home uh, the service here, and I'm so just overjoyed and happy and, and just consider myself so grace-filled to be here on this day with you, worshiping our God. For the sermon today, I invite us to pray. Spirit of God, we pray this morning that you will comfort us in your love, challenge us to grow as followers of the Christ, and open us to your truth that brings life. Amen. In 1997, I was privileged to spend a month in the desert outside of Tucson, Arizona. In August, no less, if you can imagine that. It was the beginning of my final year in seminary. and I went there for retreat to prepare for that final step in this journey. Now, if any of you have been there and had any chance to experience the desert, I can tell you and you understand it is an extraordinary place like no other. It is the only place I have ever seen lightning go up from one cloud to another. Stars in the sky you only see in pictures, and they are everywhere. And the colors of sunrises and sunset happen not in front of you, but all around you. There is a natural spirituality about the desert. Some would say, rightly, mystical. And because there is almost nothing there, the desert can focus you. It gives you nothing but time alone with God to listen, to become clear on what God is saying and where you are being called. It can renew you in spirit and set you on your path. In today's gospel, Jesus has just returned from the desert. 
Before he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth on this Sabbath day, he has spent weeks alone in prayer and reflection and communion with God. Facing his own weaknesses and temptations in this extraordinary and holy time with God. And after he returns from the desert, he's ready. He's ready. He is clear as to where God is leading him. He's ready to begin his mission, which we now know changes the world. And so he comes to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth and speaks his very first message. Last week's gospel reading is really part one of a story that concludes with today's gospel. They first hear a message that brings them joy and comfort, in which they welcome warmly. What they hear from Jesus last week is a message of hope. The words of Isaiah the prophet. Here is a promise of healing, he tells them. God will deliver you from all that oppresses you. You are chosen by me and you are special. And I will bring you freedom. I am with you. I see what you need and I will give it to you. And what Jesus is speaking is truth. Jesus is there to let them know that God is with them in him to heal and comfort and protect and lift up and free. And that message is received with joy and with welcome. And they cannot take their eyes off of him. They are amazed, the gospel says. The Greek word, if Thalmazan translated as amazed, means really marveled. Think of what it is to marvel to be drawn in by something extraordinary. But then there's a shift. Jesus gives another message, no less true than the first, along with the comfort of a God who hears and answers and protects and heals. There's a hard message as well. Yes, you are a chosen people. You are blessed and sacred and beautiful. But so is everyone else. God's mercy and God's love are bigger than you. You see, what Jesus was trying to do in that moment was to teach them to open up their view of God and others to a deeper truth. He was trying to help them know the extraordinary healing love of God. And while that could and did comfort them, it also meant that their illusions had to be shattered. Their illusions of isolated self-importance, of being above and better and more entitled and more worthy than others. And that hurt. And they pushed back. They resisted, so much so that they tried to push him off of a cliff. But isn't that what all of us do? When God tries to stretch us and teach us, teach us to see God in the world in a different way, we also push back because that means we need to change. See, the path to knowing God is never a straight one. It's filled with joy and peace and struggle and profound discomfort. And if we decide to leave the road when it's no longer easy, we will miss the beauty that God has waiting for us not so far away. I want to tell you and share with you the foremost transformative and God-soaked and beautiful and life-changing moments of my life. The first was my ordination 24 years ago. It was the high point, the culmination of a seven-year journey in seminary that took me to so many different places and to so many different people. It was truly a profound, and a holy day. 
Second was my wedding day, which was the day that God had led me to for 33 years, my whole life at that point. You see, my favorite game to play in kindergarten at recess was family with those little cut out wooden blocks with the mom and the dad and the kids and the dog. That was my favorite game to play. Marriage and family are what I was made by God for. The third was the birth of my first son, Luke, who literally, and when I say literally, I mean literally, took my breath away when I saw him for the first time. I was trying to tell Sarah Jean that it was a boy, but I was so overwhelmed that I could not speak for 10 seconds. And the fourth was the birth of Matthew and David, who completed my journey into fatherhood, also quite literally filled me up. There's a picture of me with Matthew in one arm and David in the other arm about 30 minutes after they were born. And this feeling of abundanza, which I'll explain to you in another sermon at another time, was all over me. I hear some of you might know what abundanza means. But that's what I felt in that moment. Now, each one of those moments was preceded with times of deep struggle and doubt, joy and anticipation, disappointment and fear, moments of hope and the palpable sense of God right next to me. And I could have, in that journey to those moments, at any time said, enough, I can't do this anymore, and pulled the plug and said, I'm done. But if I had, if I had avoided the struggle, if I had avoided the pain, I would have missed it. Missed the face of God that was waiting for me here and here. My sisters and my brothers, God will call you onto the narrow path to uncertainty and to doubt, and yes, even confusion. And some of you may be on that path right now as I speak to you this morning. And if you are, I want you to listen to me. In the middle of this time, God will protect you. God is leading you. God will comfort you through it all. Because on the other side of what you are going through is deeper life and deeper faith and truth. Further along in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says this, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Fire is what Jesus' mission was in the world, with his words and his life. Fire, which brings warmth, and light, and comfort. It heals, and it purifies, and even at times protects. But fire can also burn and frighten and destroy and overcome. It can send us into panic. And the choices we make in those times of struggle and panic and confusion can mean everything. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who died a little over a month ago, was a prophetic voice to the people and the government of South Africa and to the entire world, really. In a 2009 interview with late night talk show host Craig Ferguson, he said that he was reflecting on the life of Nelson Mandela and all that he had gone through in his fight against apartheid. And he said this, struggle and challenge can either lead people to bitterness and anger, or it can help burn away the chaff. Fire is what Jesus brought on that Saturday morning in Nazareth to his hometown synagogue. Fire was what he announced with the message of his life. To live in the fire. To live in the comfort and the hope and the peace of God's love. 
to live also in the uncertainty and upheaval and offense of God's challenge to us. That is what it means to be a disciple. Aeschylus, the great tragic playwright from Greece, once wrote, the one who learns must suffer. Even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. And in our despair against our will, wisdom comes by the awful grace of God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what God is teaching you. Don't be afraid of being confused or doubting or questions or rough waters. Don't be afraid of the fire. Our first lesson today from Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you. I have put my words in your mouth. I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. Jeremiah was born to be a prophet, and God gave him everything that he needed. God knew each one of you and has a purpose and a vision for you from the first moment of your life. And you have everything that you need to find that dream that God has for you. It's already there. Everything that you need to find peace, to be healed, to be free of what weighs on you, you have it already. Because God has already given it to you. God wants you to become who you were created to be. But the path to that person will lead you through struggle and hope, panic and peace. The way to who you are created to be, to the answers you are looking for, to the healing you need, or that someone you love needs, is never by going around the fire. It is always by going through it. Fire is why we're here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the fire. God is in all of this. Once again, let us pray. Spirit, we pray that seeds you have scattered this morning will find root in us and not wither because of worry or temptation or the cares of this life. Amen.
us confess our faith in the form of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God who enters our world, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. Lord God, as we think about the ministry of Jeremiah and Jesus and our own lives, you have guided and led us to the places we are, and you give us a vision for the future. You give us all that we need. You bless us in all the seasons of our lives. Help us to feel and experience that guidance that you have for us. That even through challenges, through difficulties and suffering, you are always with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all affected by the weather, especially in the Northeast. Uh, watch over those who are homeless, those who have inadequate housing. Watch over those who clear the roads for us and are out amongst us as, as servants, EMTs, and firemen and police, and all those who keep us safe. Bless all those who must travel, especially where the weather has been particularly poor, and watch over all those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our nation and our world. We continue to pray in the midst of the pandemic that you keep folks safe, that you watch over our health, that you continue to guide leaders and medical folks as they use their skills for us. We ask you to watch over places far from us but significantly affected like the volcano in Tonga. Uh, we pray for those in South Africa uh, affected by Tropical Storm Anna, for those that have passed away from that and those that know destruction. Bless and care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for St. Michael. We pray for Saint, uh, Pastor David and his family. What an exciting time in the life of this congregation. As we have been praying, we continue to pray for your guidance, for your direction, both for them and for the congregation of St. Michael. Help us enjoy this joy of reaching uh, this new season in the life of the congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for all we know uh, who need a special measure of your care this day. Be with Marco and be with Rose. Watch over Linda and be with Ted. Watch over Nori and Todd and Tara. Be with Laura and Jess and Ruth. Be with Darwin and Taylor. We thank you for his good news. We ask you to be with Jimmy Lee and Jamie and Hilda. Be as well with Dawn and Jamie and Ginny. Watch over Ed and be with Robin. And be with those who mourn, especially the wrestler and Corbin family and we take a moment of silence to lift up still others in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we entrust all for whom we pray, confident in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. This is the time in our service when we might ordinarily take an offering. During the pandemic, we've discontinued that, but there are offering plates in the back that you can place a, a gift in, or if you're worshiping with us online, there's a link on the screen where you can give online, or many folks have transitioned to that uh, as well. However or whatever you give, thank you so much for that ministry that that accomplishes. It's a natural thing to think about church staffing on a day like today as you uh, call a, a new pastor. And uh, Ryan and Marissa and, and uh, Elsie and our many other, our other staff here as, as well at church, you, you help to provide that staffing through your uh, support of the congregation. So again, thank you um, as we pray today. Good and loving God, we rejoice in the birth of Jesus who came among the poor to bring the riches of your grace. As you have blessed us with your gifts, let them be a blessing for others. With the trees of the field, with all the earth and heaven, we shout for joy at the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please stand as we sing together our closing hymn, Christ Be Our Light.
in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd ask you to be seated for a couple of brief announcements. Most of these things are in the newsletter or in your bulletin, but I just want to highlight them. The need for special food donations for the local food pantry tax, um, and also the need in, in around the country for blood donations. Um, if you haven't been here in a while, please check your church mailbox. Um, there are church directories and offering envelopes in there. Um, also in the newsletter, it talks about an associate member status for maybe those gathering online or for others that might be interesting. Um, they're also still looking for folks um, who will be follow me captains um, and funeral luncheon helpers. Um, and uh, also the congregational meeting will begin immediately. So at this point, I will invite forward Lanny Lewis, right? Our, uh, I guess we have the post loot. We want to have a post loot? We want to have a post loot. We'll have a post loot, and then immediately after that, um, Lanny Lewis, our church council president, and our uh, synod warden, uh, Leslie, Pastor Leslie Richard, will be with, uh, will help to lead that meeting. So enjoy the post loot, and we'll prepare for that meeting. 